You're listening to Pop, the History Makers, with me, Steve Blame. John Azelwood, welcome. Um, I mean, you've had a pretty amazing career already. You're uh, one of Britain's leading music writers. You've interviewed every major pop star over the last three decades. You write for Mojo Classic Rock. You've contributed to The Guardian, Independent, Melody Maker Sounds, or the list goes on. And you wrote the sleeve notes to George Michael's reissue of Listen Without Prejudice, Volume 1. And you've also written a number of books and contribu uh, contributed to others. Love is a Drug, Radiohead, Life in a Glass House, and of course the one we're going to be talking about today, Decades, Joy Division plus New Order. Um, I always start these interviews with the interviewee's own past and where they were brought up and what they were surrounded by culturally as a very young child. So can you tell me what your parents listened to when you were young and what the sort of cultural surround of your life was like? Well, I, I grew up in, in a, a very, what we call in Britain, a very working class area. My father was, there's the now obsolete occupation of milkman. This meant that seven days a week, he got up at four o'clock in the morning and delivered milk to the, to the good people of a, a local council estate, which is, is, is like social housing. Um, and my mother was just a, just a housewife. And there was very, very little culture around us. It wasn't that sort of environment. My mother listened to a bit of Frank Sinatra. We had a, an old fashioned stereogram which merged in, in the cutting edge of technology in the, the 70s and 80s, it merged a radio with a record player. And this was probably the, the, the best thing in our house at the time. Now, much, much later, uh, when I became a music journalist, then I had the, the opportunity to take my father to, to several concerts. And his, his musical appreciation broadened so you had this kind of 60 70 year old man who was suddenly discovering the cure and van morrison and and i took him to see george michael and he absolutely loved it and i took him to see the judds too and afterwards the judds had a a, a a party and looking enough i was i was invited and i took my dad along and he saw, he saw Naomi Judd in the distance, sipping uh, something alcoholic with her very, very important record friends. And he sort of, he was a very polite man, but he sauntered up to her and said, Naomi, I'm Arthur from Rotherham. I bet you don't know what Rotherham is like. And she, of course, she was absolutely lovely, lest we forget. And she said, uh, no, Arthur, I don't. Tell me about Rotherham. And he, of course, took this as an actual direct question. For some time, he did continue to tell her about Rotherham. So I kind of, I, 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 without, I don't want to take the credit because it was, it was he, he got into it himself and he loved it and he discovered things, partially because he wanted to know what I was banging on about at work. And he, very late in life, he broadened his, his cultural horizons. And if, if that, that broad cultural horizon had been there when I was growing up, I think it would have been much better. It'd been better for me. And he would certainly have enjoyed that. But it came to him late in life. So better, better late than never, as they say. Was, um, your was your interest in music spawned during your school days like mine? Because I think we're, I'm going to say we're roughly similar age. I think I'm a bit older than you. I was born in 59. Uh, you're a little, I'd like, to, I'd like to think, well, you are actually literally <laughs> older than me. Yeah, uh, thank but you. I, I enjoy very much talking to people who are older than me now. It's, it's, it's now a novelty. Um, I mean, it's, 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 I don't know where it comes from. I mean, the first, the first, album I, I ever had as a, an absolute tiny tot was an album of television themes, not even the originals. It was some kind of hack orchestra who played the, the thing, particularly Hawaii Five-0. And it wasn't, I can, I can remember it now, it wasn't the sort of brash Mort Stevens version that, that was truly wonderful. It was a, a broad copy of it. And I was five or six. I was six. I had no no way of discerning what was good or bad. I didn't realise that this wasn't the actual Hawaii Five O theme that I was seeing on telly. Um, but that was the first thing. And, I, and as five year olds do, I played it and played it and played it and played it. And then from from there, things began to 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 grow. 
But, you know, I realised very early on, I would never be one of those frustrated people who thought they were a musician. Can't play a note, can't sing a note. Although I did, I did appear on a Hot House Flowers B-side, but I think they might turn the microphones down for, for my bit. Um, but it, it's, so I was never frustrated in that way. You know, I grew up doing punk. I could, the, the thought of joining a band never crossed my mind, chiefly because I was extremely talentless. But it just wasn't on the agenda. I never felt the urge to learn or anything like that. But I did. I did want to write about music and I did want to share what I was enjoying in music with people. When I was a teenager, you know, my greatest hero, because, I, you know, I was 13 around 72. And of course, there was Bowie. And uh, but Bowie represented more than music to me, because as a as a gay man at that period, he represented another world where I could escape from my parents and go into. So he represented my future. Was there an artist that represented in during your teenage years something more than just their music? I, I, I think it, I mean, the teenage years are incredibly difficult whether you're, you're gay whether you're straight or, or whatever and it's said then times change things fluctuate but what remains constant is i think how difficult teenage years are and i think if you do have if you do have someone who can hold your hand can guide you through then it's a massive source of comfort and yes you had you had david bowie so many people did i think for me it was it was probably it's probably Kevin Rowland out of Texas Midnight Runners. Um, I mean, in America, they, they're, they're seen as a little bit of a novelty act because of Come On Eileen. But Come On Eileen is, is wholly unrepresentative of what they did. They, they made music, which at the, at the time, Kevin called it intense emotions. And of course, that is absolute meat and drink for a, a teenager who is far from sure of himself. And you had songs like Plan B, which spoke very much of, of the things that I felt I was going through at the time. You know, the prospect, you know, the, when you're very young, the prospect of, of when you're 14, 15, 16, the pro prospect of having a girlfriend, absolutely an other world, let alone forming proper relationships. The idea that you kind of stuck, as I was in this northern industrial town, and I, I knew I had to get out, but I didn't really see the means. I didn't see the key to unlocking it. So while I was, I was going through all those, my parents were getting divorced as well. And while I was going through all that, then yes, music was a, a constant comfort. And Kevin Rowland very much spoke of the things that I was going through. It, was, it wasn't particularly teenage lyrics or anything like that. It just clicked. It just clicked. And it's, you know, you're as the clicky, then you're very much the person who is uh, who's in control of this and um, in control of what you decide takes your fancy. In a sense, it doesn't matter who, who it was. Obviously, for you, David Bowie, still a great artist un unreservedly. Um, Kevin Rowland, I still feel the same the same way about that. He is a great artist, but it doesn't matter who it is. It's what it is, the effect that it has on you. So how did you get actually get into music journalism? And um, how good or bad, because at the beginning, I also wrote about single releases for a local newspaper when I was young. And I wrote these appalling pieces, which were derivatives of everybody else's, I think. So just tell me about the process of you becoming a music journalist and how that went at the beginning. Well, in, in, I realized that I went to university. I went to university far away and universities have university newspapers. And I thought that that would be the way in in which I could I could actually use a, a, a talent that I sort of didn't really know that I had. But I thought if I if if I went to university if I went to the university newspaper, then I could meet people because I was in a different social class to most people who who went to university. I could meet people, and I could also, if I play my cards right, I could also meet bands because bands played at university. And I thought it might be a good idea if someone interviewed them. And I thought too that that somebody was me. So I, I took very tentative baby steps uh, in order to, to work out 
what you're what what you you're doing, and it's very difficult. I've got no template. I had no idea. I had no idea how you wrote. I had no, certainly no idea how you interviewed anybody. But you can, as you suggest, you can make your mistakes in public, albeit in front of a very limited public. And then when I realised, when I realised that this was something that I, I did like doing, you know, I like meeting bands. I like getting free records. Of course I did. I was a kid. Um, I thought this was something that I could pursue. So during the... Uh, during the very long vacations in, in university time. Then I stayed in the area and wrote free of charge, and worked every day for a local magazine. And you know, I did some absolutely dreadful stuff. It was shocking, a lot of it. But they, they, weren't, they weren't paying me, they weren't paying anybody, of course. So it was a voluntary exercise. So it was also, it was a fantastic training ground because for sort of two whole summers, I was going into the offices of a magazine, a very shambolic magazine, but a magazine, a proper magazine, nevertheless, and learning and absorbing and being very sponge-like. So I, I, I realised then that this was, this was probably the only thing that I was quite good at. You know, don't ask me to cook your meal, don't ask me to change your fuse, because in both instances, you will probably die if you if you give me those tasks. But what I slowly learned to do was I learned to interview people and I learned to to write about them too. And it's and the more you do it, the more you 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 pick up. And so while I was at university in in Southampton, which is a, is a port city on, on the, the south coast of Britain, while I was while I was there, then I bombarded the national music press with suggestions for me to write. And again, I didn't know how to do it. I was too shy to phone them up. So, and there was no such thing as email in those days, of course. There was no such thing as, uh, as social media or even the internet. So I was sending these letters by snail mail, giving, sending sample reviews of bands I'd seen, trying to make them, yeah, you know, dreadful local bands, trying to make them suitable for publication to a national audience. And then reasonably quickly, one of them bit sounds, which was one of the big three music newspapers in Britain at the time. They said, and I think they're probably just kind of trying to get rid of me, frankly. But they said, yes, do some reviews from Southampton, and that was a start of, of doing it nationally. And you know, I couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. You know, seeing my name in print in a national music publication, just the, the shock and the awe. I mean, to be honest, I've never quite lost the, the, the ego boost of seeing my, my name in print uh, all these years later. But I, you know, I can remember how I felt then. And there's still a bit of a, 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 you know, there's still a kick there now. It doesn't, it doesn't change. So that was, that was very much how I started. And then I moved to London and tried to, to pursue it properly, whilst, of course, having loads of other jobs, because otherwise I'd have stopped. So let's get on to the book because it's called Decades Joy Division uh, Plus New Order. Um, how did this actually come about? Was it your decision or were you approached to write this book? Um, I, I was uh, approached I was approached by uh, the publisher, Palazzo, who I'd, I'd done uh, a little bit of, of stuff with before. And they said, that we think, we think, we think you're the man to tell the tale of New Order uh, and Joy Division, because it's never been told in this in this sort of joint sense before that there hasn't. They said we'll make it we'll make it look beautiful. You go off and write some beautiful words, and we'll reconvene in six months and make something that hopefully we all agree is quite good and that we can be proud of. But it's a tale. It's it's you know the band members have had their say. It's that the band members are incredibly prolific. You've got a drummer who has written two books about his time in Joy Division and New Order. You've got a, a very disgruntled bassist who's written a couple of absolutely fantastic books, lest we forget. And you have the, the very enigmatic, elusive lead singer of New Order who has written a very enigmatic, elusive book to go with his records. You have the widow of the singer of Joy Division. She's written a book. It seems as though everybody has had a go, but what nobody has done has, has, has managed to not have an agenda. Everyone has, and quite rightly so. You know, you want to hear the basis story. Of course you do, especially when he's such a fantastic writer and he, he's got so many eyebrow-raising stories to tell. 
So there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But no one, I think, has been able to step back and take an overview of this extraordinary story of two extraordinary bands. And that that's really where I came in. Did you actually then start off by, or had you read this plethora of biographies and and uh, books about the band before, or both bands before, um, or had you, you know, did you initially have this idea, or was it something that you came to through a process, and what was that process? Well, I mean, I was I was I was certainly familiar with with some of the books that had been written, and I, there there is a, a good deep well of literature to be written about them. But Joy Division were a band who, who had obsessed me since I saw them. Um, and I, I, I felt that that story had never, it had never properly been told because, because of the assorted agendas, because you have people close to them who, who've, who've written books and that too, takes on a different kind of agenda but this this story and it, it, it's very Faustian in a way of, of what happened to these four very working class people who weren't always the best of friends who came together who stumbled their way through the the early days and who who made this extraordinary music and then to find it cut short um, and and <laughs> It's a tale, I think it's a tale almost unlike no other. And then, having lost, literally lost, the singer of their first group, then the rest of the group rebrand themselves, get back together, don't retire, simply because, a bit like me, they didn't have any other talents whatsoever. There's nothing else they can do. They were wholly unsuitable to, to be in the real world. And then they reinvent themselves and become this global phenomenon. And then several years later down the line, it ends in, in tears and acrimony. And you have two old friends, people who'd been together since primary school, who'd lived incredibly close to each other, who, who had grown up, who had gone through this experience of Joy Division, who'd gone through the New Order experience of selling millions and millions of records, playing giant stadia. And then they fall out. And that's heartbreaking on every every level. So for someone coming to their tale without an axe to grind in, in either way towards, towards any of them, for or against, then it's the perfect tale. Because it's a tale that the more objectively you tell it, the more remarkable it becomes. I, I'm glad you use that word, you know, those words, the more objectively you tell it, because you start in a sort of contextual way, describing um, the 70s, describing Manchester and Salford, describing an era that has long gone and was frankly shit. <laughs> you know, the 70s were a really difficult era to, to grow up in, and they were really nothing um like today so can you give me an idea of the era that the members of the band um joy division we start with that uh well obviously the members of both bands then but the you know the members of joy division when they what they grew up in what their families were like and what sort of uh, the differences are back then to today well the the, the two people who, who we we need to talk about here bernard sumner and, and peter hook they grew up Together, they came. They went to the same primary school, the same secondary school, and they came from a, an area of Manchester called Salford. Now, Salford is is the largest inland port in Great Britain. It's a massive dock area, and of course, this had been very, very heavily targeted and bombed by the Germans in World War Two. And he, when they were growing up in the sort of late 60s and early 70s, the damage hadn't been repaired. So there were areas of Salford that looked very much like a, a kind of lunarscape. It was, there was, it was derelict. There was, there was also the backdrop of this was not just that the Germans had, had destroyed it, but successive British government policies had contributed to Salford's decline. And this once 
proud port was now just another inner city area of Manchester. It was down at heel. And both Peter and Bernard came from um, kind of quite quite similar families, I think. But, but there was illness. There was a perpetual, constant struggle for money. And there was also, I think, the suggestion, too, that there was no way out for, for working class boys. And if I think if you grow up in that sort of area, then you, you do have options, but none of them are great. If you're good at sport, you can get out by playing football. If you're a, a particularly assertive personality, then you can stay in these places for the rest of, of your life and become a sort of community leader, the, the, the head of the gang, as it were. If you're particularly passive, you can stay there and little will have changed once you die at 75, if you're lucky, that you will have lived a mundane life, done very jobs very similar to what your parents have done and barely, barely left a place like Salford. And I, I think that both Bernard and Peter, they weren't particularly academically bright, but they were smart, both of them. And the, the catalyst for them, I think, was, was seeing bands in Manchester once the, the, the punk revolution blossomed. They'd been to see bands before. They'd seen metal bands. They, um, <laughs> Peter Hook took Bernard Sumner to see Deep Purple, and yes. And you can imagine the, the, the horrendous look on his face, you know, Peter Hook, once a rocker, always a rocker. But um, but they both shared an interest in a lot of the, the new wave groups. They they saw the Sex Pistols, apparently. They uh, were massive fans of Iggy Pop. And I think they understood, too, that they didn't need to be technically proficient because these bands weren't. They had attitude and you can learn. You can learn to play the bass. Of course, you need natural talent and everything. But but if you learn, you can tap into that natural talent and not sound like anyone else if you're not properly trained. They both essentially taught themselves. And I think I, I think Joy Division were a, a group who were looking to escape their environs. And then further south in, in Macclesfield, you had uh, Stephen Morris, who came from a much more middle-class background, a much more culturally rich background. They, they, they kept fish in a tank, which apparently is, is, is the mark of high sophistication in, in the Macclesfield area. And his, his dad was a big jazz fan, and he would take him to see visiting artists. And he too became immersed in that, that world. And it was all, Stephen Morris's world was always quite comfortable. And nothing to be ashamed of it is it is what it was, of course. But it was very different to the hard scrabble upbringing of the two guys from Salford. And then you had Ian Curtis, who also came from Macclesfield, and he too was was bright in his his own way. His father was a, a British transport policeman, uh, which is not a respectable job, a decent amount of income and he too grew up in in a, like Steve Morris in a much more suburban environment than the two inner city guys did but Ian Curtis was always uh, more obsessed by music than I think any of them but he was also very much a loner too as we would see in his his later life but he he musically absorbed absolutely everything he was listening to to reggae he was selling records vinyl records at, at macclesfield open air market so there's an entrepreneurial side to him which is often forgotten when when the myth mythologizing comes but ian curtis was uh, essentially a businessman you know he want wanted more than any other person i think in joy division for that band to sell records and to be popular and you could tell that from his early entrepreneurship but he was you know, he was a, a strange guy. He was a bright guy. He didn't have many friends. And he, too, took, I think, comfort in music. And he was the one who wasn't listening to sounds like Bernard, Peter and Stephen were. They were getting absorbed by the sound of music. Ian Curtis was absorbed by the sound, but also the power of what could be said through music. And it turns out, luckily for us, that he had quite a lot to say. It also seems like they had 
I mean, particularly Bernard and Peter, and I, and I, I would think uh, Ian as well, they had in incredible drive. Um, did that, do you think they, they did have a massive drive because it came from their social situations, particularly someone like Bernard who had a family situation which sounds incredibly uh, difficult for, for any child to deal with? Yes, I mean, Bernard, Bernard's family situation was very, very difficult. He's, he's, his mother was extremely ill and very found it very difficult to, to cope by herself. So he was essentially, whilst on the one side being a kind of working class oik, he was also a, a very tender carer for his family. He took responsibilities at a, a young age that no boy should have to take on. And, and uh, how much how much that has has fashioned his later life it's difficult to tell because he ain't going to be telling you in his book and it's not something it's not he hasn't made anything of it really you listen to his uh, you read his lyrics with with new order and you wouldn't imagine that there's someone who'd gone through that but it's also equally hard to imagine that someone has gone through that experience and it hasn't uh, affected the rest of their lives so in in terms of, of drive, I mean, Bernard <laughs> Bernard turned out not to be the hardest working man in show business. He very much wanted to to cut corners, and I think in those early days, there was a suggestion that this is impossible. We're absolute outsiders. We are. We're never going to make anything. So let's just do this and sort of see what happens. I think particularly. For, for for Bernard, who who was the the least initially uh, as well, the least technically proficient of them all, um, I think I think Peter Hook wanted the rock and roll lifestyle, and he certainly lived that towards the end of his time in New Order. Yeah, he was the one who, as I said before, who dragged Bernard to see Deep Purple, and yes, he wanted that kind of lifestyle. He wanted the women. He wanted the leather trousers. He wanted the, the swagger. And you could see that almost from the very early days where he held his base like nobody else, so low slung. He was all half emulating Jean-Jacques Bonnel out of The Stranglers. But he was doing it in a way that I think was more overtly sexual than what Jean-Jacques Bonnel was doing. And he invented, I think, a new way of projecting bass. He never regarded it as a, an engine room instrument. He regarded bass as the most important instrument in that group. And every time Joy Division and New Order played, you could see that too. So he had a drive too. Stephen, who knows? Who knows what kind of drive Stephen had? But Ian Curtis, absolutely different. He, he was the one who wanted to sell a lot of records. He was the one who wanted to commercially go for it. He was the one who went and pestered RCA Records, who at that time, a made major label, of course, they had an office in Manchester, a Northern office. And he was there all the time, pestering and pestering and pestering RCA to actually do something with until of course they did record some ill-fated sessions with them. And surely they just did this to stop this incredibly intense young man coming round whenever he felt like it. He was, Ian Curtis was the one who accosted Tony Wilson, who essentially was the, the father of Manchester post-punk music. He was the one who, who went up to him, went up to this, this enigmatic figure who read the news on local television, this huge local celebrity, and effectively prodded him in the chest and full of swear words, which sadly, sadly, we're probably not really allowed to repeat here. He said, why won't you put us on your television programme? And I think there was prodding. I think, I think contact was made between finger and chest. And Tony Wilson was aghast. No one spoke to Tony Wilson like that. He was revered in Manchester. And I think he was so shocked that again, because Ian was so pushy, because Ian was so keen to do it, that he had to go and listen to this band because he didn't want to be accosted by this terrifying bloke again. And of course, when he did investigate, the light clicked on very, very quickly for him. 
And he, yes, he got them on. But Ian was the one who was pushing, he was pushing for sales, pushing to go to America, pushing to expand their horizons. And this is forgotten. This is absolutely forgotten that Ian was some kind of uh, uh, martyr-like figure for the purity of music. Yes, he was. That's completely true. But he wanted the music that he was making to reach as many people as possible. I mean, going back a bit to the to, to the Sex Pistols gig or gigs that happened in '76, they're the mythological gigs where uh, you mentioned that they may have gone to, which surprised me. Peter and and and, and Bernard, <laughs> did they go to that gig? And was it? I've been, sl I've been slightly, I've been slightly mischievous because everybody yeah. in, who formed a band in Manchester says that they did. Yeah. But um, I, I. 100% believe that they saw the Sex Pistols, as did Ian Curtis too. Uh, and, and you know, they hadn't seen anything like that in Manchester. Manchester wasn't, well, it wasn't a hotbed of punk by any means whatsoever. You know, Sad Cafe were the most cutting edge band in Manchester at the time. And to have someone like the Pistols drop in, and of course, again, mythology means you, as you, you, use gigs in the plural, and you're, you're quite right to do so. The first gig, hardly anybody there. Bit of a shambles, and the Pistols playing a lot of old rock and roll songs, lest we forget. Second gig, much more, uh, much better attended because the Pistols had some notoriety about them. But the Buzzcocks were there. Mick Hucknell from Simply Red was there. Uh, and and so were so were Peter, uh, Bernard, and, and Ian. And yes, this must have been music from another planet. And they'd seen Iggy Pop before, when because Iggy Pop had played Manchester uh, in in his mid seventies barren period. But this was something else. This was homegrown, and yeah, I think you saw the Pistols and saw how shambolic they were. And a, a, another light bulb must have been switched on at that moment. You must think, yeah, okay, they can do it. They're getting notoriety. I can't play either, but maybe if I learnt a bit, we could do this. We could actually do this and do something. There was also, um, you know, if we talk about that era, and um, obviously it was the advent of punk during that era, it was also the <laughs> era where Bowie would go, you know, around that era to Berlin and the influences of German New Wave, of Neu, um, of Kraftwerk, and of course, although slightly different, of Cannes, who are from my now home city, Cologne, where I am now. Um, and I just want to know what the influence on those early days were for the band and what they really were sort of reaching out for musically. Well, initially, initially it wasn't clear at all. I mean, the first the first things that Joy Division did when they were when they were called Warsaw, when they were trying to get a deal with RCA, they were they they were bog standard derivative punk. You'd never imagine that these people were familiar with or Kraftwerk or any of those crowd rock groups. It just didn't sound like it. And you know, you go back and these these demos are sadly, I think, widely available now. And you listen to that very early material. And to be honest, to be honest, you can't you can't sense that there's greatness afoot. It was that they were trying to find their feet. And I think the way that they were trying to do it was essentially to copy Slaughter and the Dogs, who were a very, very ordinary Manchester punk band. But they were the only Manchester punk band. And they had Rob Gretton, who would later manage Joy Division in New Order. He was, he was a sort of roadie for them. And they, that was how limited their horizons were, that they were just trying to emulate this average punk band. But Ian in particular... Ian began to. Ian was listening to to kraut rock. He was listening to the the, the melodica of uh, melodica even of Augustus Pablo, on the reggae side too. Steve Morris, as we said before, he was listening to jazz, and then they slowly brought this kind of music in, and they began to to I think understand that you can go in another direction. And they slowly began to do this. But I think, too, that the, the, the catalyst for turning them from bog standard punk copious to this extraordinary otherworldly band was Martin Hannett. 
Now, he came in and he encouraged the more esoteric sounds that Ian and Stephen were listening to. And he was, I think, the, the gateway by which they could bring this different kind of music in. And as soon as, as, soon as Martin Hannett got involved, then Joy Division were no longer a very average punk band. They were suddenly something else. They suddenly, and it was, it was very sudden, they suddenly created this homogenous world of their own. And all the best bands create a world of their own. And Joy Division did this very easily once Martin Hanna was aboard. Was that because of Ian Curtis's um, love of buzzcocks <laughs> that Martin Hanna came in? I think that, well, there, there was Mar Martin Hanna was once they signed. Well, they never actually signed to. Once they got involved with Factory Records, then Martin Hanna was a, a potential producer to to go to, and Ian was very very keen on, on using Martin Hanna because he has ever he saw the bigger picture which the others didn't see. He realised that that, that Mar Martin Hanna could sprinkle. Magic and yes, he produced the Buzzcocks, of course, were the, the biggest stars at that time, who who also in in later life moved on towards some of those kraut rock and the electro sounds on, on that fantastic album, a different kind of tension, and that so Martin Hanna was was the go to producer in Manchester if you wanted not to sound like Slaughter of the Dogs. And he, his relationship with Ian was incredibly intense. He, Martin Hanna was, was rude, abusive, curt, cutting, everything else to the others, which was quite a shock for an alpha male such as Peter Hook. But Ian, Ian was, was like his little baby, except they shared. They shared this, this understanding of needing to push the boundaries, to bring in melodica to bring in kraut rock and ian ian had been listening to this to to kraut rock those electro bands for a while you know he hadn't gone so much for craft work the obvious choice he had gone for faust and can and noi the, the the harsher bands and you can hear that and i think this is where that world of joy division came from because they had these kraut rock influences from other side the the, the other side they had the punk rock influences too, but they also had that Manchester influence. That I used the word moonscape before, and if you listen to Unknown Pleasures, you can hear the moonscape that Bernard and Peter could see as they grow up. It's like almost science fiction music, but it couldn't come from anywhere else but in a city Manchester. And that sounds like a load of contradictions, and it is, but when they all came together, then it made something beautiful. Bernard went from Bernard Dicking to Bernard Albrecht to Bernard <laughs> Sumner. Um, you know, the name of the band, Joy Division, you know, has a, a connection to uh, Nazi times. Was there a, a flirtation like Bowie had or was that just coincidence? I, I the, the evidence, the, the evidence is quite um, it's quite persuasive in terms of yes they did they unquestionably flirted with Nazi imagery but of course Joy Division Joy Division is a is a, a name of sympathy it's, a, it's Joy Division is a name which aligns with the oppressed because it was that the comfort wing in concentration camps where Jewish women were obliged to provide sexual services for the Germans. And I, I think that unquestionably is identifying with it. And yes, and there was early imagery as Bernard turning himself into Bernard Albrecht, which uh, wasn't a good idea then, and it certainly isn't a good idea now. Um, the the a lot of the, the cover art of of some of their their earlier singles too, and it was. A, a bit awkward. You have Ian Curtis shouting, "You all forget Rudolf Hess," uh, when he's on the the Electric Circus Cir compilation album too, and they unquestionably flirted with this. But uh, if you separate that from the people who they were, then Peter Hook hasn't got a political bone in his body. I'd be 
surprised if he'd heard of the Nazi party, to be honest. Stephen Morris, likewise, a little more aware, a little more intellectual, no possible evidence of any kind of political uh, affiliation whatsoever. Bernard, slightly different. I mean, he certainly, I think he, it's 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 an awful thing to say, but I think he he flirted with a lot of the the imagery of some of the, the the Nazis in those early years. But I I think because because he's no Nazi, of course he's no Nazi. I don't think he realised the implications of what he was doing. Now with with Ian, it it is it's slightly different. He did uh, ex he never expressed kind of. Nazi views or, or racist views or whatever. He was, a, as I said before, he was a big reggae fan too. Not that that doesn't mean he was necessarily anti-racist or whatever. But he he did he did flirt to use that word yet again with some of the, some of the the, the more uh, with with some of the, th of the things that Nazis were saying. Now it doesn't mean for a second that he he was anything like that. But I think he studied it a little bit more. And I think that's that's fair to say. And I think some of the the images that he used, you can you can take sort of right wing authors such as uh, Celine, uh, the, the the French the French Nazi guy. A lot of the images that, that Ian uses are very similar to that, but it's based around isolation. Everything that Ian wrote was about himself. He had no other agenda to put in. And I think as a kind of cultural crusader, he felt it was his duty to explore and absorb as much culture as he can. So I, I think overall, overall, you can get Joy Division off the, the Nazi hook, primarily through naivety, I think. And, you know, he's, we may be making a... a terrible mistake by letting them off the hook. But I don't think, I don't think there's been anything where you could suggest that they have behaved in any way to suggest that they had Nazi views. It's just kids flirting stupidly. When they were at their height, what was a Joy Division gig like? What could you describe it? Well, um, when when I when I saw Joy Division, I saw them uh, supporting Buzzcocks, and it was like it was something that I'd been to a lot of gigs. I was going to see so many gigs because I'm absolutely obsessed with with music and and stuff like that. And I get at the front, me and my friends would go to the front. We'd come home and our, our ribs would be bruised; they'd be purple when we woke up the next morning because we've been pressed against the front. And I was literally at the front of the, the, the show for Joy Division. And, you know, you may say that it's some kind of great insight to suggest that this band were absolutely fabulous, but it wasn't. It was so obvious as to how great they were. It wasn't a, a, a brilliant deduction on my part. It was there, literally, in front of my face. And I'd never seen a frontman like Ian Curtis. And, you know, I was just a kid. But I don't think I ever have all these decades later. The intensity that he put in, the way that he projected, the way that he moved. And the others. Yeah, Bernard, Bernard Sumner trying to play his melodica and his guitar and looking, looking great and slightly bewildered in the way that that Bernard often can but he was taking everything in and Peter Hook this extraordinary sexual force of of nature and seeing him and it was you know you were supposed to be seeing a, some kind of post-punk band here but it, it but Peter Hook played like he was a member of a, a metal band he looked like a viking he didn't look like anything post-punk at all and what he brought was that, as I said before, this this notion that the bass can be a lead instrument just as much as the guitar, and of course, and then behind you had Steve Morris, this extraordinary drummer using what I now know to be different techniques based around jazz, but the whole together, it was absolutely breathtaking, and I think too that I, I unquestionably, I wasn't the only one to see this. I think everyone who was there saw it because it was obvious. That's amazing.
Um, you mentioned the lyrics of, of Ian Curtis, and I just wonder when, you know, when he wrote things like She's Out of Control, which is like looking at his own problems from a different perspective about someone else, but maybe about himself. And, um, and I just wondered how aware, or when did the band, the rest of the members of the band become aware um, of his uh, problems, his epilepsy, his depression? When, when, when did they become aware of those sort of things? Well, I mean, l lest we forget, they weren't childhood friends. They hadn't grown up together. Ian Curtis, Ian was a, a stranger to the others when they, they, they came together. So they hadn't got any background. And I think they, they knew he, he was a bit odd and had mood swings from being this incredibly gregarious, funny guy with a, a goofy sense of humour to someone who was uh, all together, much, much darker. But when you're trying to establish uh, a relationship, a working relationship with someone who you don't know, then you, you, you tend to test them out and see what they're like. But Ian and Bernard, uh, sorry, but Peter and Bernard didn't. They were incredibly, almost surreally uncurious people. And even, even now they claim that they had never read Joy Division's lyrics. These songs that they played along to every night for years, they say, and I've no reason to disbelieve them because they come over are so gormless that they didn't know what Ian was singing about. <laughs> so this darkness that was seducing me and, and so many other people, they were at the center of the storm, completely oblivious. So they had no idea of these lyrics. So it was it was a bit of a surprise to them. After they, they played their first concert in London, at a, a, a very poorly attended event at the Open Anchor in Islington. And they were they were driving back and uh, in the van. Peter Hook used to drive. It was it, it, it's a like some kind of situation comedy. And it was freezing because it was it was between Christmas and New Year, absolutely freezing as they drove back in this van you can imagine what the heating was like and uh bernard and uh, ian started having a little tussle over the duvet and back and back and forth and yeah it'd been a rotten evening dreadful gig long way to drive home absolutely freezing you can see that temperatures might be frayed and of course it's the, the tugging of the duvet became much 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 more physical and uh, then Ian started lashing out and his lashing out turned into an epileptic fit. And the band, the rest of the band had literally no idea. They did the shock to them. You know, you can imagine they're having the boyish fight. Hooky's driving. Stephen is doing whatever Stephen does. Um, there's, there's probably a roadie in, in there too. And suddenly this guy has this epileptic fit and they simply didn't know what to do. And the only thing they could do was drive straight to hospital. They took him to, to Luton and, and Dunstable Hospital. And that was the first that they knew about it. And even then, even then he didn't encourage Bernard and Peter to read the lyrics that he was singing but they did it, it they they obviously realized something something was afoot and ian was was on very strong medication which uh stopped these fits and they had to take it because i think that the the, the 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 medical consensus seems to be that he was fitting so badly that he could very easily die during them so of course he had to have strong medication and I think then that they realized that they'd have to treat him slightly differently and there are countless examples of compassion towards him and he would have he'd have fits on stage he'd have very bleak dark moods and of course we know how, how that ended um but very quickly they realized that they were, were were dealing with someone who was not like other men one of the things that I found really fascinating in, in your book is the description of the period around where he took his life. And the um, on one side, having a sort of perspective and talking about the future, 
you know, the bookshop or something he was going to do in the future. On the mm. other side, you know, um, the not wanting to officially split, I think it was from his wife, um, having a girlfriend um, and on the verge of an American tour. So there were this sort of, there was this sort of dichotomy of positives and negatives going on um, in his life. Can you explain to me why or why you think that all became too much for him? What, what do you think, you know, in essence was the trigger and why couldn't anyone or wasn't anyone aware? I don't know if they were aware. Why couldn't anyone actually save him? That's a hard, that's a hard question. You're, I mean, you're, you're, you're right to paint. There's two separate sides to what's going on. Ian's life was in absolute turmoil. He had a, a young daughter. He was splitting up from his wife, who'd been incredibly tolerant for many, many years. He was having this affair, which may or may not have been consummated with, with the, the kind of glamorous Belgian sophisticate that his wife certainly wasn't. And he was also living this lifestyle, this rock and roll lifestyle, where it, it exacerbated his condition. He wasn't getting enough sleep. He wasn't getting regular hours. And these made everything worse. And that must have been absolutely intolerable for someone as, as sensitive and someone who saw the world like Ian did. It was, a, it was an untenable situation. And... Yes, I, I, I believe he was about to get divorced, but because it was in, it wouldn't have been an, an ordinary divorce. It was tied up with the, the guilt of, of the affair. It was tied up with wanting some kind of future. And I think uh, Anique, the mistress, was clearly someone who was much more suited to Ian's temperament and lifestyle than his childhood sweetheart Debbie was. But, you know, she's a, a formidable woman. She's a brave woman. She's incredibly tolerant. She did so much for him. And I think he was he was aware of, of, of a lot of that. And uh, as we know, Joint Division were about to go to America. And Ian was the primary force pushing them. It wasn't something that he didn't want to do. I think towards the end, he might have felt that he couldn't do it because of everything else that was going on in his life. But he absolutely wanted to do this. And he, he changed a lot of his, his medication. The, the situation at home exacerbated everything. And once Debbie kicked him out, then he lived with Tony Wilson for a little while. Bernard took him in. And there's, there's this sort of heartbreaking story of him and, and Bernard going the, a few days before Ian took his life, going to the, the pub and seeing this stand up comedian. And everybody who's there, the recollections are of Ian just laughing like a drain at this stand up comedian. You know, that's not a, a guy who's on the verge of, of killing himself. And, this, and Bernard, who, who's you know, very cagey about all this, yeah, he spoke, he spoke of, of, and it sounds clumsy, but you can see Bernard's best intentions here. He spoke of walking with Ian through a graveyard late at night and saying to, to Ian, look, is this where you want to be? Or do you want to go to America with us? And yeah, in his own way, he was, he was making an effort. And on the, the, the day that Ian died, Bernard went to, to Blackpool to do... Uh, water skiing in the sea you know he didn't he didn't think that something was about to happen so the 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 actual death of him was a, for something that many people saw as inevitable was a total shock and you can i think hold those those two views at the same time and you know, no one knows what happened in that, that night that he spent at the, the marital home on his own no one knows what went through his head. They know that he, he kind of watched German art films, listened to Iggy Pop, drank a fair bit. Um, you know, the guy's on his own. If you if you speculate, you're inevitably wrong about it. And I, and it's not the right thing to do, not being prurient, but we just don't know. We just don't know. And clearly at that moment, he felt it was in, impossible to go on. It doesn't 
seem like it was a cry for help. It seems like it was a, a proper go. And he had tried to kill himself before. How has his death fed into their legacy? I, I, uh, Ian's, Ian's death was, <clears throat> obviously it was the end of Joy Division. But the, the, I think the crucial factor here is, yes, it was, a, it was a martyr's death. It sort of meant, and it really is sort of, that he, he believed and lived the lyrics that he was singing like very, very, very few lyricists. You know, all the clues are, are in there, the, the self-loathing, the, the despair, the, the loneliness, the, the sense of foreboding, the sense of imminent death. They're there across Joy Division. But I think that the, the beauty of, of their canon is that it's so small that essentially it's just two albums and a few sing, a few singles. And because Joy Division instantly stopped, then that's preserved. It's preserved in, in musical aspect forever. There, there, there's, there hasn't been a big clutch of unreleased material that wasn't there. There's a few concerts that have been exhumed, but no one really, to be honest, cares. Um, it's just those two albums and the attendant singles. And because it's so small, because it's so beautiful, because it's so perfect, then Ian's death has fed into that mix. You know, Joy Division never got old. Ian literally never got old. But Joy Division are there sounding like they did in 1982, and that can never change. You know, mercifully, we've been spared, say, a remix album or something like that. But even if that happened, it still wouldn't matter because you've got those two albums and those singles. So there's nothing. It's untarnishable. And because it is such so perfect and so complete, then, yeah, Ian's death has, has fed into that completely. But lest we forget, as soon as they became New Order, then they changed. They changed us not just musically, but there was there's no real sense of, of overriding despair in New Order. They changed their their attitude, so you can't, I think, link the two in that way. And of course, Joy Division. Uh, sorry, of course, New Order didn't play Joy Division songs for years and years and years. And especially in the early days, this this brought them a lot of criticism. But it was a really brave thing to do. And I think too, it was absolutely the right thing to do as well. Because if they had done it, I think it would have tarnished Joy Division's legacy. And decades later, they can play Joy Division songs and it's great. And, you know, Peter Hook could do solo tours of entire Joy Division albums. That's fine too, not a problem. But in those early days, to bravely set that distance between the two groups, then, yeah, that was that's an important part, I think, of preserving Ian's myth. Now, Peter and Bernard, or the Seas, <laughs> were shown <laughs> for New Order in New York, in the club scene in New York. Can you tell me about that period when they were in New York and what was going on? It sounds extremely wild. <laughs> um, it, it, it was. I mean, there were... Bernard began to, to listen to the, the nascent house move, movement and he began very quickly to understand that the first New Order album, Movement, was an average album. It was like Joy Division if they'd been an average group. It was Joy Division without their, their de facto leader. And it, the, 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 the notion that New Order could continue like that is, is nonsensical. And they, they were, thankfully, they were smart enough to realise that, that you cannot, cannot be Joy Division light. And as I said, Bender was listening to this, this newfangled house music he i think understood that it was possible to go there as they, they planned to do before Ian, Ian died and listen to the sounds in this in the clubs and then emulate them and it, it sounds a bit clumsy it sounds a bit provincial to be honest but it wasn't it was an absolutely inspired idea it was very much helped by the fact that uh, on one of their first american gigs all their gear was stolen this meant all the old, the, the old fashioned guitars and everything else. And then they, they reinvested the money uh, on uh, dance instruments, on you know, synthesizers uh, and samplers, very primitive, of course, but they, they were still doing the investment. 
Um, and I, it, it sounds contrived, but this was the music that was genuinely moving them. And it was, it's a way out of Joy Division. And they were desperate for that. And it was, <coughs> sorry, it was, of course, it was, it was absolutely genuine. And to actually go there, to go to these clubs and listen to what was going on in New York, which had the most vibrant dance scene of all <coughs> at that time, along with Chicago and uh, St. Louis. But New York was the one. New York had the clubs. It had... <coughs> Pardon me. It had the clubs. It had it had the clientele, and it had that absolute musical bravery that new movements tend to have. And no one was doing this in England. People were listening to some of those early New York and Chicago records, but no one was doing this and applying. How can I put this? Applying an indie logic to it, and that's why when New Order turned in this direction with say everything everything's gone green which i think not the best song but i think the most pivotal song and no, no one was doing it like this people just yeah, heard everything's gone green no idea they didn't have any idea what new order sounded like beyond joy division light of movement wow this is earthquaking nobody bought it but it paved the way it paved the way and it's even now it's a good record it sounds for want of a better word authentic and so yes you know they were getting bernard enjoyed the lifestyle he enjoyed the people he enjoyed the the, the drugs and the other activities too um peter never that taken with the music but but lest we forget that a lot of this music had absolutely massive bass lines so he would very very quickly came to terms with this and said he could still dress like a viking and still play these magnificent bass lines it was win-win for him you know he didn't have to like uh peach boys or or whoever whoever was uh, and anything that arthur baker was doing he didn't have to like it, it didn't affect him i mean the drugs were part um and parcel of that scene and um i remember in my you know this was for me a bit later on in the late 80s always coming over to Germany to going to, to to Frankfurt to the Omen to Dorian Gray and just going completely deranged but the drugs would play uh, an aspect in the enjoyment of the music not to be too over the top and I just wondered how much uh, the drugs that, that you see as being instrumental in some way in um, the development also of their music. I think <laughs> I mean, a lot, a lot of the, the the drug and drink troubles came a lot later when they were much more established, and I, and and that certainly had a detrimental effect on on Peter and Bernard's relationship much later. But they were uh, they were in, they were incredibly naive about drugs when they went over to to America at first, and they did uh, um, embrace that that culture but you know peter Hook tells of, of uh, taking cocaine for the first time uh, and it's like it's like it's a little boy from manchester which in effect is what exactly what he was now i think they they, they soon realize they soon realize that um they that the drugs were to an extent a way of opening their their creativity but i think in those early days there was there was a lot more drink they'd been working just to go back to, to joy division for a second they'd been working with martin hammer and on the last joy division the second joy division album closer then he was heavily into to, to drugs and heroin in particular and that had made that relationship very very difficult ian was of course on on a lot of uh, authorised conventional medication. So he wasn't really going to do it anyway. So they were just they, they, they were just kids, kids in some kind of sweet shop that they didn't really know the rules to. And yes, they, I mean, they picked up on it very, very quickly. But uh, they, when they were making music with Arthur Baker, who a very straight man, then it was about, I think, the sounds for them the drugs became a burden much later and <clears throat> yes there, there there is the a, a, a constant relationship between new order and drugs or certainly there was there was in some of the glory years but i don't think it makes them different to other bands of the same status was there a naivety about money as well <clears throat> um, yes <laughs> 
is the is the very short answer to that. There was a, a tremendous naivety uh, uh, about money. Their their manager Rob Gretton was sort of seen as a, as a kind of bruiser, really, but he wasn't particularly financially astute, and the drugs certainly got to him much uh, much later, and that caused a, a lot of a lot of problems. They had this very very casual relationship with factory records um, who were notoriously poor at accounting. Um, but the money, they, they had a major label deal in America and the money did, it did become, uh, 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 the money came, they had a major, sorry about that, they had a major label deal in America and the money did start to, to come in. But they they were naive, and obviously they invested in the, the hacienda, which became the great cash drain. And once factories started going belly up, then people like New Order were left. And there was a very insalubrious attempt to sell on the catalogue, but the factory couldn't sell anything on because they hadn't got a deal with anybody. So it was, it was, it was unclear who owned a lot of New Order and, and Joy Division music. And, and that became very messy. But like when bands start, uh, the, the, clearly this sounds incredibly unromantic and unsexy, but clearly the first thing that they should do is appoint a qualified, proper accountant. How many bands do that? I, uh, my rough estimate would be zero. And it certainly was, wasn't the case here. So entangling this, this weave of complicated finances with a company who didn't care in that, of course, factory sold more 12 inch copies of Blue Monday than any other single. And they contrived to lose money on each one. It's, it's, it, it's, uh, you know, obviously it's a scene from Spinal Tap, of course, but it's not very funny when you're selling all these records and you're paying people to buy them. It's bananas, but it's also bananas when you think about the Hacienda, because I remember going there sometime in the early 80s might be in 82 three, four, something around that era it would have been and going up there you know and and spending the night and then driving back uh, in or having someone drive us back a friend who didn't <laughs> you know I'll take in anything and and the weirdest thing about the um the club is that the stage was not able to be well seen because of these columns, what I remember. So it was sort of a weird choice. And it also, you know, in the book, I didn't realize it had these different phases to its existence. Can you tell me about that as well? Well, I mean, the, 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 it, 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 it sounds as casual as it was, I think. Peter Hook said, uh, look at me, look how I'm dressed. No club in Manchester will let me in. I want to get in a nightclub. So the only way I can do it is by building my own. And that's roughly, it's a slightly crude interpretation, but it's roughly why the Hacienda came to exist. And New Order put an awful lot of money into this. And it was seen as, as this magnificent project in the centre of Manchester. How could it possibly go wrong? Let me tell you how it could possibly go wrong. There were three phases, three phases. First was the early stages where they had bands, any old bands, from Blue Rondo a la Turk played there, Madonna played there, as did loads of hopeless uh, indie acts too. The, and for most of this first phase, the, the Hacienda was uh, essentially empty. It was empty because one, as you pointed out, you couldn't see the stage because of these giant pillars. Two, the the it was cold, partially because no one was in there. But it, it, it that sounds sounds slightly flippant, but it's not in February in Manchester, I promise you. And three, the sound was awful. So you go and see these bands. You go go to to these bands' concerts. You couldn't see them and you couldn't hear them properly. So, so which kind of kind of dilutes the, the the whole notion of going to a concert. And then all of a sudden, apropos of nothing, Acid House comes. And uh, the Hacienda is now, for a very, very brief period, the centre of the universe. It's the hippest club in the country, possibly even in Europe. It is packed out every single night. It's seen as where um, British Acid House began. Great. Full every night. How much money did it make? Not very much at all, because people were uh, having ecstasy. And for those those who have taken ecstasy understand ecstasy and drinking alcohol 
are not compatible. Therefore, you had a full club and they're all buying still water. They're in the toilets. One, taking their ecstasy, but two, queuing up at the, the cold water tap. Amount of money generated? Very, very little. So even in even in its glory phase where coach loads were coming from all over the country almost every night, it still wasn't making any money. And then there was the third phase, the death of the Hacienda, when suddenly British dance music stopped. It's no longer tenable, just as suddenly as it had started. And then the Hacienda reverted back to being a nightclub and having bands on. And uh, it was taken over by the drug gangs. So therefore, the, uh, often uh, armed, there was it was quite a scary thing to go to the Hacienda. People didn't like it because they thought, with reasonable uh, good reason, that they were going to get hurt. So therefore, you had this final phase, the death of the Hacienda, where it's populated by drug gangs. Not very many of them. But they were there. They were the ones who were running it. And again, no money is being brought in because what, what, what you do know about drug gangs is they, they're not that keen on paying a fiver for a pint. So no money there. People were too scared to go. There was the, you know, a, a council committee to, to do with the granting licences came and they came for a look round and see it's all right. And then at that point, someone was shot while they were there. And... <laughs> and, and yeah, so you had these terrified sort of old maidens and, and grizzled, grizzled old councillors. They really, really don't want to, to be at the scene of any kind of shooting. Um, and so the, the drain on New Order's finances, because Rob Gretton didn't have the will or the way to get them out of this, because uh, Factory and Tony Wilson were pumping so much money into it too, then... That was the financial black hole, which destroyed, certainly destroyed factory records. Didn't destroy New Order because they would, they would eventually claw it back, not from the Hacienda, but they would, they'd, they'd go on to different things. And they would indeed sell their, their catalogue to a major label. And they, they, a lot of their success was out of Manchester at this stage. But they'd all be a lot richer if they hadn't gotten involved in the Hacienda, which is, of course, the, the ultimate nightclub cautionary tale for our times. The order had immense success, and you, and I'm jumping, of course, but you mentioned earlier that um, uh, Peter and Bernard, at one point, and I think you said because of drugs, um, fell out. Was it because of drugs, or were there other issues at that time? Well, I mean, Bernard, because he's Bernard, uh, behaved badly more discreetly. Um, but Peter was not discreet in his drugs and drink he ended up in rehab and he's, he's very open about this I, 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 I'm, I'm not revealing confidentialities um <clears throat> and yes I think it, it made him appear very unreliable but it was also the reason for their bust up was um musical differences Peter Hook was a road warrior he wanted to get out on the road be a viking sling his bass down entertain the crowds and embrace the rock and roll lifestyle after a point it's something that Bernard just didn't want he became a studio bunny. He wanted to make music in the studio. He saw that as the, the, the way to, to preserve New Order as a going concern. And you can uh, absolutely see both sides of, of this view. But there was, a, I think, a third factor, which possibly was the most crucial, that in his slightly deluded state, then Peter began to resent the music that New Order was making because he felt that his contribution as both a, a, a songwriter uh, and a, a player in the studio was being drastically reduced, that he'd come in, play these massive bass lines, and he wouldn't find them on the record. And uh, he felt he was being forced out. And I think that's, <clears throat> those three things are the, the primary reasons why their friendship broke down. But also, again, they, they're kind of northern working class blokes. They didn't really have heart to heart. This was this was happening and it was very passive aggressive. It was it was not talked about. And that reflects back on that culture that they, they came from. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily sad to see two childhood friends fall apart in that way and so publicly um but it's you know it's what happens in bands they say that that 
or political lives end in failure, but oh, the bulk of band relationships end in failure too. <clears throat> um, the band didn't end. Peter left, but the band continued, and Peter played because play, he loves playing live. Is what I understand. So the in in comparison. <clears throat> Uh, when you talked about Joy Division and their legacy, what is the legacy of New Order with them having gone through this phase of continuing after, and I say it from my perspective, after maybe their peak? It's, New Order's legacy, I think, is much, much more complicated than Joy Division's, partially because there's so much more of it, partially because you have... Uh, different phases and partially because there are so many albums from New Order now that it is it's, it's difficult to, to focus on one or two albums but I think that the, their legacy is is that they they for a time they were the most cutting edge band on the planet they did change the direction of music and you hear some of those early dance singles, you know, Everything's Gone Green, Temptation, Blue Monday too, which people tend not to talk about because it was so big and it's the elephant in the room, but it certainly shouldn't be. Listen to Blue Monday, that massive, long version. You hadn't heard music like that before. You'd heard bits of it. But it was they're, they're, they're almost like those monoliths in 2001 A Space Odyssey, I think, that they, they moved things on a bit, sometimes inadvertently. But they also sold a lot of records. They were an international, and they still are, an international going concern. Now, you can pick any moment almost where if New Order had stopped, their legacy would be fine. But they keep going on, and their legacy is still fine. It's still intact. At the moment, you've got this double-headed monster. You have Peter Hook, who is single-handedly preserving the catalogue, of both New Order and Joy Division. He's going out live, he's doing individual New Order albums, he's doing individual Joy Division albums, he's doing a greatest hit set, there's no suggestion of new music, um, and he's taking that music to the people. New Order are still the mothership, even though Peter hasn't been there for so long. You know, you talk about the new guys, they've been there for ages, they've been there for decades. Um, you talk about that and they, do make new music and some of it is still very good and I, I'm being slightly cagey here because it's not all great and as a biographer we have to be honest about that and say that it is not all great and <clears throat> um, but some of it is still very good and they go out live too and they preserve New Order's legacy, they preserve Joy Division's legacy to, to a lesser extent but also also they make new music too and they're pushing they're still pushing in their own way. You know, Bernard isn't a pushy person at all, but you can sense that he doesn't embrace the past in a way that Peter Hook does. And that too is a good thing. So New Order are, they're, they're, you know, they're part of the, the, the oldest circuit to an extent, but not completely because the music that they do make now is good. And Bernard is still something I think of a visionary. I think your book is a real true feat of music journalism. It's an incredibly, it's it's a wonderful read. It's beautifully written. Um, and one thing I haven't really mentioned, although you mentioned it at the beginning, is all these photographs, which are a, sort of an additional wonderful uh, part. Was there any photograph in that book that surprised you and for you really sums up your emotion um, towards either Joy Division or New Order? Well, I think if... if um, I, th I think, let me sh show you a picture, if I can possibly show you a picture. I think... How's it? Could you see that one all right? Yep. That's, that, I think that picture is... Encapsulates, encapsulates Ian. He's absolutely in the moment. He's totally and utterly absorbed in what he's doing. His eyes are half closed. He's got this incredibly untrendy haircut. He's no fashion victim, Ian Curtis. 
he's just lost. He's absolutely lost in in the music. And I think as a, as a visual representation of him, that's probably that's probably the best picture. But if if also if I can show you this one too, then um, you have here. This is I love this photo. I love it. That's again. Hope you can see that. Okay. Oh yes. That is that's a new order in a kitchen in a kitchen, looking incredibly grumpy, incredibly ill at ease, but I think there's mischief in that picture. It's always just, New Order, the beauty of it is it's just under the surface. And a really good photographer can capture this because they are, they, they, they were in that period, an absolute collective that we, you know, we haven't mentioned Gillian too much. And of course, Gillian was a person who was brought into New Order and they taught her how to play. And of course that sounds incredibly patronizing, but it's not, it's a stroke of genius. <laughs> Why not get someone in the band, teach them how to play and they can only play that way. And it fits in perfectly with the band. And she has a, she had, has a say on countless issues too. She's no sh shrinking violet. She claims, and I believe her completely that she never ever be, the, there hasn't been prejudice against her, although Peter has said some less than pleasant things afterwards. Um, and she's part of it too. And she she brings obviously literally a feminine dimension to what they're doing. But it also it leavens, it leavens Peter Hook's masculinity, it leavens Bernard's sort of dithering. And he's a good ditherer, is Bernard. It leavens that too. Make, she's a perfect addition. And now, of course, you have a situation where I don't think anyone is claiming that New Order are a democracy, that Bernard is firmly in charge and it's his direction. But there isn't any more, there isn't that urgency all these years later. You know, you're talking 40 years? I think you are, aren't you? You're talking 40 years. It's been possible to keep, to keep up that sense of urgency. And that's fine too. It's not selling out. It's just slowly coming to terms with who you are and what you are. And I think as leader, Bernard is more uh, at terms with who he is and with what New Order are than he's ever been. And I think that's probably the legacy that he's looking for. John, I we're talking about decades, Joy Division plus New Order. Thank you. Been a pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews and here is where you can connect.